Good evening and thanks for joining us. This is NTD Business and I'm Paul Graney. The latest data on jobless claims is out. It's the fourth week to come in under 1 million and the lowest in recent weeks. We visit a Jewish entrepreneur in New York City. He tells us what the recent peace deal in the Middle East means for businesses across the region. Small landlords in Seattle sue the city and state over the eviction ban. We hear from the lawyer who's representing them. Now we talk to the Epoch Times Washington correspondent Amela Khan. She recently, recently paid a visit to a unique farm in Delaware, part of the government's Opportunity Zones. The number of Americans filing for new um, unemployment claims fell slightly last week, but is still at extremely high levels compared to before the pandemic. The Labor Department says 860,000 Americans filed for unemployment last week. It is the fourth time this year that the number has come under 1 million, and the lowest since the pandemic began, but the number remains historically elevated. Uh, we need to benchmark that uh, new claims, uh, all the claims we're seeing are at historically high levels, and that speaks to the real pain that's out there on the part of people who are uh, losing their jobs in the midst of this pandemic. Some states previously considered virus hotspots saw a decline in new claims, including California, Texas, Florida, New York, and New Jersey. But the number in California alone is still about the same as the entire country before the pandemic. One bright spot in the economy is the housing sector benefiting from record low mortgage rates. So we see home sales hanging in there quite well. Building activity is up on a year-over-year -year basis. Looking ahead, the $300 to $400 weekly unemployment benefit is expected to run out of funding this month, as Congress is at an impasse over the new relief bill, and the risk of a federal government shutdown also looms, unless Congress and the president approve new funding. Hamrick says he believes they'll at least sign a continuing resolution to keep the government in business. I visited a business owner in New York this morning. He says the Middle East peace deal opens up a world of possibilities for entrepreneurs in the Middle East and even here in the U.S. He says the phones haven't stopped since Israel, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain agreed to normalize relations last month. After Qatar, Israel and the United Arab Emirates have the highest per capita GDP in the Middle East. Facilitating trade and tourism between the two nations and Bahrain is huge. Most powerful Avi Kainer is a third-generation Jewish co-owner of the Morton Williams supermarket chain in New York. He's been an advisor to multinational companies and also co-led the financial component of a presidential commission under President Clinton. He says entrepreneurs in each of the countries are very excited about the deal. I've got to tell you, over the past month, the phones have exploded with, with business opportunities. I mean, they were just waiting to happen. And now suddenly, with this peace and prosperity plan, it's, it's kind of the dam's been opened. Kainer says highlighting prosperity and the economic benefits of peace has been key. Well, in, in the past, the focus has been on, on solving Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right? Then another focus has been um, focusing on the Iranian regime threat. Now, this focus of peace and prosperity supersedes all of that. It's an umbrella that covers everything and it benefits everyone. Among others, Kainer credits President Trump and his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who led the effort. He says their business experience was critical in getting the deal done. But there's another aspect of leadership, which is in the United Arab Emirates. You look at Mohammed bin Zayed, uh, known as MBZ, He's really instituted a culture of tolerance and coexistence in the country. And the United Arab Emirates have even taken it a step further. The government of Abu Dhabi actually sent um, a memo to every hotel operator in the United Arab Emirates asking them to implement the ability to provide kosher food. It's just absolutely remarkable. President Trump is confident Saudi Arabia will sign on soon. That will bring the president one step closer to realizing what he calls the toughest deal in the world, peace in the Middle East. And Texas is loosening CCP virus restrictions in most parts of the state. It's allowing more businesses, including restaurants, retail stores and gyms, to expand from 50 percent to 75 percent capacity. The state's virus cases have started going down after summer surge. But in New York, 
The mayor has again delayed the start of in-person classes for most students. Middle school and high school students return to the classroom October 1st. Elementary schools will open on September 29th. And small landlords across America are apparently getting fed up with the blanket eviction bans. It's not only causing problems for landlords, but tenants as well. Landlords in one city are now su suing to end the ban. Entities Phil Zoe reports. Small landlords in Seattle are suing the city and Washington state over the eviction ban. Both the Seattle mayor and Washington governor are named as defendants in the lawsuit. We spoke to the lead attorney in the case. He says the eviction ban is unconstitutional and it creates an incentive for tenants not to pay rent. The lease expired in July, but they continue to occupy the premises and don't pay rent and they haven't paid rent since April. Blevins told us most people affected are mom and pop landlords who are also suffering from the pandemic. We don't expect you know, a small grocer to give us free food and we can't expect landlords to provide an essential service like housing during the pandemic. They are facing the pandemic as well. He says landlords actually don't want to evict tenants. They want to work things out, but the eviction ban makes things really difficult. One thing that these bans don't understand is that landlords don't want to evict. It's a last-ditch option. It's very expensive for them. It's very costly to both parties. We spoke to the largest landlord association in Washington state. The association said landlords aren't the only ones suffering. Tenants are also suffering from the ban. A single mother of two a tenant who, who got a knock at the door. She answered the door. It was another tenant. This, this man exposed himself to her and the kids. And we're not able to, to do anything to get rid of this, this guy. Trickler says his hands are tied because the ban is too general. It doesn't give landlords any solution, even when it comes to criminal activity by the tenants. It doesn't put any mechanisms in place to allow us to, um, uh, to deal with I individual cases. Um, it, it just treats everybody with the same broad brush, whether it be landlord or tenant. In addition to the Pacific Legal Foundation lawsuit, Trickler tells us he knows of several more lawsuits in the pipeline against Washington State and the ban. Phil Zoe, NTD News. A New York state has filed civil charges accusing Johnson & Johnson of insurance fraud. It says the company downplayed the risks of opioid painkillers to doctors and patients. The state accuses Johnson & Johnson and its pharmaceutical affiliate of targeting elderly patients for opioid treatment, but hiding the risks of side effects like falls, fractures, or other symptoms. The company was also accused of using marketing materials to dismiss opioid addiction as a myth. It's been charged with violating two New York insurance laws, faces civil penalties of up to $5,000 per violation. Johnson & Johnson says its opioid marketing is appropriate and responsible. The charges by New York's Department of Financial Services are the fourth in the opioid industry probe. Johnson & Johnson faces related claims in jurisdictions outside New York. And a former J.P. Morgan Chase trader has been sentenced to eight months in prison for conspiring with other traders to rig currency trades. He was also fined $150,000. Prosecutors said the traders would swap trading positions and customer information through chat rooms, phone calls and text messages. It was to boost profits at customers' expense. The case was part of a broad probe by the federal government into currency manipulation by the banking industry. The judge said it threatened the integrity of the market and the idea that everyone did it is no excuse. Banks, including J.P. Morgan, have paid more than $10 billion in fines to resolve regulatory probes into worldwide currency manipulation. And Opportunity Zones are bringing investment to America's forgotten regions. A recent White House report says they brought in $75 billion in private investment in just two years. It's much faster than expected. Epoch Times Washington correspondent Damela Khan visited one in Delaware. She went to see Second Chances Farm, a hydroponic indoor farm. Asked her how it went. It was very interesting. I have been writing about Opportunity Zones for a while, and I visited some of them. I believe this was uh, the most interesting one, uh, because I visited an indoor farm, a vertical indoor farm in Wilmington, Delaware, in one of the poorest neighborhoods in, in that region. And it, it was uh, in, inside of 
I believe 50,000, nearly 50,000 square foot uh, warehouse, former fair house. Uh, they grow plants inside uh, waters in containers and no soil. It's called, uh, it's a technique called hydroponics. It was my first time, so I was really, really uh, interested. And I saw a lot of vegetables, greens, they have lettuce, um, kale, spinach, um, basil. And they basically produce this, uh, these uh, products uh, all year round and uh, they sell them to, they are designed to sell, uh, this business was designed to uh, serve restaurants and groceries nearby. Uh, but because of the COVID-19, uh, they had to change their business model and they have like more than 300 subscribers and they deliver to homes. Uh, it's been a nine months uh, since the launch and it's very interesting. It was really uh, um, touching. Uh, I was there with, um, um, because of the visit uh, of um, uh, housing uh, secretary, um, Ben Carson and uh, William Barr, uh, Attorney General. Uh, so they had a tour and then they had a round table with the employees and founders. So it was really interesting. And I believe from your article, it's all uh, released prisoners, former inmates. Is that correct? That's true. If you want to have a job in this company, you have to be former inmates, as you said, former prisoner. They call it returning citizens. And it's very interesting. So far, they had hired um, 36 people and they go through a training program. Uh, they are not only getting jobs and salaries and some other benefits, but they also have a mentorship program. They have other skills, uh, training skills. It's amazing. It's very touching, actually. And when we were there, uh, they shared their personal stories. Each one, uh, each one has very interesting, unique background, and very touching stories. They, you know, they told us how long they served in prison, and what they saw after they got out of the prison, because their life is very, very tough uh, after prison. And they tell, they told us like how they couldn't get jobs, uh, because employers do not really want to hire these people. And so, very touching stories. One of the um, people was a former Harvard graduate and he was a teacher and in the past and he couldn't get a job because uh, when he got out he couldn't get a job because Delaware State do not allow um, people charged with arson uh, to go back to schools to be with children so he said that now he likes the job he does he's a corporate trainer so all these stories were really interesting and because of the opportunity zone angle and also, you know, prisoners, um, both Barr and um, um, Secretary uh, Carson was there and we had a chance to talk to them as well. Uh, it was really interesting and great, uh, inspiring story, business story. Sounds like it's having a very positive impact, Amel. Appreciate you coming on and speaking with us. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. And U.S. stocks dropped as technology-related shares extended the recent slide today. And data still shows high level of weekly jobless claims, as we mentioned. Apple and Amazon were among the biggest drags in the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq. The Dow fell over 130 points, or 0.47 percent. The S&P 500 lost over 28 points, or 0.84 percent. And the Nasdaq dropped over 140 points, or 1.27 percent. And the UK's central bank is considering negative interest rates for the region. This will make it cheaper to borrow money, but will also mean people could have their savings whittled away if they're deposited at a bank. Ask Daniel Akaya, chief economist at Tress's hedge fund, what he thinks. Negative rates are the destruction of money. If we, under, if we understand what interest rates are, interest rates are the price of risk. So when central banks implement negative rates, what they're actually doing is creating a massive perverse incentive to take too much risk and at the same time it does not improve the economy. The example of the Nordic countries that implemented negative rates or the Eurozone shows that uh, the, that first the improvement in the economy is, is inexistent. Second, massive increase in debt obviously and very risky debt. Third, it doesn't solve the problems of solvency. And fourth, and I think that this is the most important part, is that central banks believe that the reason why credit is not growing as much as they would like it to grow is because interest rates are too high. It is not true. There's the perception of high risk, there's perception of weakening of solvency from borrowers, and negative rates only end up zombifying the economy. And did we see this in the, in the Nordic countries that you mentioned? 
the Nordic countries had to abandon their policy of in negative interest rates precisely because they didn't work. And uh, obviously, central banks never uh, accept and never say that they have failed in their policy, but they had to actually go out of negative interest rates precisely because the, uh, the, the impact that they wanted to achieve did not happen. And the negative effects on the financial sector, very important, the financial sector ends with negative uh, earnings and uh, very poor uh, net income margins and return on tangible equity. So it weakens the financial sector. But more importantly, it incentivizes the wrong side of risk taking. And can you see this happening in the UK now, considering the current circumstances? I think that the UK should not follow the example of the Eurozone. I think that, at first, it has a much more diverse and robust uh, financial sector. Uh, it also has a very strong credit environment for households in which not just banks, but also uh, different types of lenders have a very significant private lending environment that actually is helping the economy strengthen uh, from the pandemic. So implementing negative rates would not get the government to borrow at a cheaper rate. It is already borrowing at the lowest rates ever. And it would definitely increase malinvestment and the wrong side of risk taking. Seems they've avoided it for now, at least. Daniel, appreciate your insights as always. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you. And still to come. A new report says investment between the U.S. and China is at a nine-year low. Pressure continues on Chinese tech firms. Now H&M says it's pulling production out of China. And the U.S. Chip Industry Association lobbies the government for up to $50 billion in federal funding. They say otherwise, the U.S. won't be able to maintain leadership of the industry. That and more after the break. A new report says investment between the U.S. and China has dropped to its lowest point in nine years. With the Trump administration's tough stance on Chinese companies over national security concerns, it could keep dropping. According to half-year 2020 data, bilateral investment between the U.S. and China is at a nine-year low. That trend looks set to continue as pressure builds for Chinese companies to move out of the U.S. A report by Rhodium Group Consultancy says investment, including venture capital flows, fell to nearly $11 billion in January to June. That's down just over 16 percent on last year, the pandemic in part contributing to the fall. It's a far cry from half-yearly totals of nearly $40 billion seen in 2016 and 2017. President Trump's administration has sharply expanded actions to hobble Chinese companies, citing national security risks as a serious concern. It's not just the U.S., though. Swedish multinational clothing retail company H&M just announced it will cut ties with its Chinese yarn producer that operates in western China's Xinjiang region. A company statement read, H&M Group is deeply concerned by reports from civil society organizations and media that include accusations of forced labor and discrimination of ethno-religious minorities in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. H&M added it will phase out its indirect business relationship with its Chinese cotton supplier, regardless of unit and province, within the next 12 months. Amid the exposure of these alleged abuses, the NBA also recently confirmed it severed its tie to a Xinjiang basketball academy. Time is running out for TikTok in the United States. President Trump requested its owner ByteDance to sell off its U.S. operations but the plan ByteDance submitted allows it to keep a majority stake. China's ByteDance faces major hurdles to convince the White House to let it keep majority ownership of TikTok in the United States. Last month, President Trump ordered ByteDance to sell TikTok's U.S. operations over national security concerns. But the plan ByteDance submitted would allow it to keep a majority stake in TikTok's global business and build its headquarters in the United States. The U.S. government is reviewing the proposal. If the president were to approve the deal, he would have to amend his executive order. 
Experts say that's something no U.S. president has ever done in the history of national security reviews. Another hurdle, ByteDance is offering a minority stake in TikTok to Oracle. It calls Oracle a trusted technology partner and would allow it to manage TikTok's user data. But the U.S. government typically calls for parties like Oracle to be independent of the companies they oversee. And late last month, the Chinese regime updated its export control rules, giving it a say over technology transfers to foreign buyers, like TikTok's algorithm. This means the Chinese regime will also have to approve ByteDance's proposed deal with Oracle. President Trump has threatened to ban TikTok as early as Sunday if ByteDance doesn't comply with his order. The U.S. chip industry says now is the time to bring back chip manufacturing. It's asking the federal government to offer incentives to make the U.S. more competitive. The U.S. chip industry says it needs up to $50 billion in federal aid to keep semiconductor manufacturing in the United States. The Semiconductor Industry Association, or SIA, said in a new report that $20 to $50 billion in tax breaks and federal grants would make the U.S. the most attractive investment destination for chips, excluding China. U.S. companies lead the $400 billion chip-making industry, but many outsource production, mostly to East Asia. The lobbying group says absence of funding would threaten the United States' leadership in the industry. The pandemic has exposed the risks of having important components made abroad, and the group is making its pitch at a time when the U.S. government might be more willing to listen. SIA's CEO told Bloomberg, it's not a bit of a change in Washington, it's a significant shift. The report says the U.S. only makes 12% of the world's chips and it's likely to drop to 6% in the next 10 years, whereas China is projected to have the world's largest share. The report also says that it costs up to 50% more to build a factory in the U.S. compared to China and that most of the cost gap is because of government incentives. And still to come, 400 years after the historic journey to the New World, Engineers are planning a new high-tech Mayflower voyage from England to the United States. And there'll be no pilgrims on board. More on that after the break. Engineers in England are preparing a special autonomous ship for launch. Complete with AI technology, its upcoming voyage across the pond to the U.S. will mark the Mayflower's 400th anniversary. In a quiet corner of the English port city of Plymouth, engineers are racing against the clock. They're preparing the historic Mayflower ship ready for launch. I think the most, uh, the, the most similar thing between this project and the, 400, and the original 400 years ago was that neither of us are sure we were going to make it. But unlike its centuries-old counterpart, this ship has a technological edge. The Mayflower Autonomous Ship, or MASS, is fitted with a range of technologies to help it sense the world around it, including radar to detect hazards and onboard cameras for computer vision recognition. Brett Fanouf is the project's director and a founder of Promare, the nonprofit marine organization tasked with building the vessel. He maintains that they'll make the deadline. Just getting it to sea, getting all the systems integrated, testing all the technology, and then embarking on that voyage, both to test autonomy, uh, to test the AI systems, and to collect uh, meaningful data about the climate, that's a win no matter what. Chief Technology Officer of the project, Don Scott, explained how the vessel comes equipped with AI technology to make decisions. We're relying on the, uh, the expertise of master mariners. You know, you know, people that have been in these situations on how a ship is, uh, should uh, behave. And then uh, we're relying on the, the sensor system on board to give us an understanding of the ship, of the ocean dynamics. And then we can, you know, then we can tell the ship how to, how to behave and how to act in a safe manner. Scott added the AI software is similar to that used in the financial services industry for making smart decisions in a challenging environment. If successful, the ship will become the largest ever autonomous vessel to cross the Atlantic. At just under 50 feet long, the $1.2 million trimaran ship is powered by a hybrid wind and solar system. It also features a backup diesel generator. These kind of unmanned systems could prove particularly useful for research ships. So there are plans to build two similar vessels, one which will be sent to work in the Arctic. 
Mass is set to be officially launched on September 16th in Plymouth, England, 400 years after the original historic vessel set sail from the city. The ship's transatlantic voyage is expected for some time in 2021. As the latest business updates for today, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.